we mean when we say clinically isolated syndrome? How does that relate to multiple sclerosis? I'm going to answer that question starting right now. Howdy, Aaron Boster here with the Ohio Health MS Center speaking to you today about clinically isolated syndrome. If this is your first time tuning into the channel, thank you very much for coming by. Please make sure to subscribe and click that notifications button so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. Clinically isolated syndrome is a term that we apply when a human being experiences the first attack that could go on to be considered MS. Oftentimes it's one of three presentations, optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, or brainstem syndrome. Briefly to review, optic neuritis is when someone has the subacute onset or uh, onset over hours to days of loss of vision in an eye, typically associated with pain with extraocular movements. A transverse myelitis is when the spinal cord becomes inflamed, and at the level where the damage occurs, below that we can be numb or weak or both, and may often have bowel and bladder involvement. That's a transverse myelitis. A brainstem syndrome often includes uh, difficulties with balance or problems with double vision or problems with facial sensation or strength. And those would be examples of a brainstem syndrome. When someone experiences a clinically isolated syndrome, the question then becomes, what is their risk to go on to develop multiple sclerosis? In the modern era, 2018, we can clarify that using two very helpful tests. The first is an MRI an MRI of the brain in specific, and we're looking for characteristic spots that are seen on the MRI. Now, if you experience a clinically isolated syndrome and you have a brain MRI that is normal, the 20-year risk that you'll go on to develop cl clinically definite MS, have future attacks, is about 20%. If you have a clinically isolated syndrome and then you have an abnormal brain MRI that has spots that are concerning for MS, you have about an 80% chance to go on to develop MS over the next 20 years. So obviously, an abnormal or a normal brain MRI weighs heavily in uh, clarifying the risk after a clinically isolated syndrome. A second important test is the lumbar puncture. A positive spinal fluid would increase an individual's risk to develop MS after a clinically isolated syndrome, independent of the MRI. You could experience a clinically isolated syndrome optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, a brainstem syndrome, and then get that MRI, and there are abnormal spots on it. But the pattern of the spots, the number and where they're located, could actually give you a diagnosis of MS. Most recently in 2017, we have reintegrated spinal fluid. And so now there are cases where a clinically isolated syndrome with one MRI equals MS, or a clinically isolated syndrome with an MRI and spinal fluid equals MS. And why is it important to hasten the diagnosis? Very simply put, the faster we diagnose MS, the quicker we can start disease-modifying therapies. The faster that we start disease-modifying therapies, the better it is prognostically for the human being. They have a better trajectory of their disease starting as early as possible. I hope that this clarifies uh, questions about what is clinically isolated syndrome and why we think it's important to get MRIs and sometimes spinal fluid on these patients. Again, my name is Aaron Boster with the Ohio Health MS Center. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please subscribe to the channel and click the notifications button. And more importantly, leave those comments and questions below.